Welcome back, everyone, to this afternoon panel discussion. Thanks for bearing with us. Thanks for uh, still being here. Um, a small announcement. This will be an all-English uh, panel, so please don't hesitate uh, to equip yourself with uh, headsets over there. Um, and, uh, and we will have a good discussion. And also, uh, there will be another Mentimeter uh, survey that we will do. Uh, so uh, please uh, ha have your smartphones ready and be connected to the uh, Wi-Fi of the foundation. It's Freifunk and the password is Wi-Fi 4 free with 4. Um, but this will be in a little bit. My name is uh, Simon Ilse. I'm the head of the global unit, the new global unit on human security. And I was extremely uh, happy to hear from uh, Sergei Lagodinsky as well as Tony Hofreiter this morning about uh, the importance of uh, ext an extended security understanding and, uh, and alternative green concepts of security uh, that include human security and, and a broad understanding of it. Um, and I'm currently, uh, since last summer, building up a new unit on this um, for Heinrich Böll Foundation in Vienna. And I'm very, very uh, pleased and honored to have um, such a great panel that I will uh, call on stage um, in a minute um, to extend the debate. We have talked this morning extensively uh, about defending Europe, different concepts, reality checks, um, about uh, thinking it through what it would mean to think about Europe alone in, uh, uh, in, in the case that uh, the next US president will be called Donald Trump, for example. And we are now uh, daring a, uh, a perspective and a look uh, beyond Europe and beyond the transatlantic um, perspective and, and looking at a um, uh, looking southward, looking towards the Sahel region, which is, a, which is an interesting, um, an incredibly rich and interesting region, and of course a, um, a region of uh, geopolitical contestation, uh, with a lot of implications for German and European policy. With uh, no further ado, I would like to give the floor to Emma Scholz, our co-president, for introductory remarks, and then she will hand over to Professor Tim Rithi, who's uh, already waiting online. Thank you very much. Danke, lieber Simon. Ich werde jetzt wieder Deutsch äh, sprechen. Äh, liebe Gäste, auch von mir ein herzliches Willkommen hier in der Stiftung bei der Außenpolitischen Jahrestagung. Heute Vormittag haben wir bereits viel über zentrale Fragen der europäischen Verteidigungspolitik und Sicherheitsarchitektur gehört. Jetzt wollen wir den Blick in Richtung Afrika weiten und, uns, und darüber sprechen, welche Rolle Europa und auch Deutschland in der Welt einnimmt. Damit nimmt die Komplexität der Debatte noch einmal zu. Heute Vormittag ging es darum, was es den Mitgliedstaaten der EU schwer oder leicht macht, gemeinsame Ziele und Interessen in der Sicherheitspolitik zu definieren. Und Lukas Kulesa sagte da, es sei wichtig dafür, ob sich die Staaten der EU und auch die Mitglieder der NATO tatsächlich als ein Wir verstehen, also als ein Teil derselben Community. Wenn wir jetzt nach Afrika blicken und nach Partnerschaften dorthin, stellt sich diese Frage genauso. Die Europäische Union hat erkannt, dass sie, um den Frieden innerhalb Europas zu bewahren, auch einen Stabilitätsring um die EU braucht. In der östlichen Nachbarschaft ist dieser Anspruch eines Stabilitätsrings durch Russlands Destabilisierung des postsowjetischen Raums gescheitert. Aber wie sieht es in unserer südlichen Nachbarschaft aus? In Zeiten einer verschärften Systemkonkurrenz des Westens mit Russland und China ist der globale Süden ein umworbener Partner. Doch häufig werden dem Westen Doppelstandards vorgeworfen, gerade auch mit Blick auf die regelbasierte Ordnung, die er ja verteidigen will. Es stellt sich also die Frage, wie die EU Glaubwürdigkeit zurückgewinnen kann, um Alliierte zu gewinnen für multilaterale, völkerrechtsbasierte Zusammenarbeit und auch für Demokratie. Im Dezember 2022 hat sich Reinhard Bütikofer dazu geäußert und gefordert, dass sich die EU mehr im globalen Süden einsetzen muss und zwar so, dass ihre Politik nicht mehr Schaden als Nutzen anrichtet. Also das sind seine Worte. Insbesondere müssten wir uns gewärtig sein, und jetzt zitiere ich ihn direkt, dass alle diese Länder, alle diese Völker kämpfen, um ihre eigenen Perspektiven, 
ihre eigenen Handlungsmöglichkeiten, ihre eigene Rolle, ihre eigenen Interessen, ihren gebührenden Respekt. Deshalb, denke ich, muss es um Partnerschaft gehen, die beiderseitig hilft, im beiderseitigen Interesse ist. Wir richten jetzt unseren Blick auf den Sahel und auch auf Afrika und die EU insgesamt. Die EU und einzelne Mitgliedstaaten wie Deutschland und Frankreich versuchen, im Sahel seit einem Jahrzehnt diese komplexe und fragile Region zu stabilisieren. Sie tun dies mit einem vernetzten Ansatz militärischer und ziviler Mittel und die Bilanz dieses Engagements in der Region ist freundlich gesagt gemischt. Denn glücken kann so ein Engagement, wie gesagt, nur wenn es auf guten Kooperationsbeziehungen ruhen kann, mit klaren, konkreten gemeinsamen Zielen sehr unterschiedlicher Partner. Die Legitimität des europäischen Ansatzes, insbesondere des französischen Engagements in der Region, ist begrenzt und die Effektivität der Stabilisierungsprogramme gering. Trotz vieler guter Ansätze, etwa bei der Sicherheitssektorreform, der Demokratisierungshilfe oder der Rechtsstaatshilfe, kam es in den letzten Jahren, das haben, wissen wir, in Niger, Burkina Faso und Mali zu Militärputschen. Und das wirft die Frage auf, ob ein sicherheitspolitisches Engagement Europas in der Sahelregion überhaupt gewünscht ist und unter welchen Umständen es hilfreich sein kann. Was sagen die lokalen Bevölkerungen dazu, was die afrikanischen Anrainerstaaten und die afrikanischen Sicherheitsinstitutionen wie ECOWAS? Angesichts des Scheiterns der Stabilisierungsmission im Sahel müssen wir uns fragen, was sollten zentrale Elemente einer neuen europäischen Strategie für Westafrika sein und was sollten die, die Prinzipien einer grünen Afrika-Strategie sein? Und können die EU und die Afrikanische Union in Fragen der globalen Ordnung und Sicherheit zusammenarbeiten? Können sie das oder sollten sie das bleiben lassen? Die Antworten sind wichtig für eine Politik, die Europas Glaubwürdigkeit im globalen Süden stärken kann. Das ist kein nice to have, sondern ein zentraler Baustein europäischer Beziehungen in der weiteren europäischen Nachbarschaft und auf multilateraler Ebene. Mit unserer neuen Unit zu menschlicher Sicherheit in Wien, Simon Ilse hat es gerade gesagt, wollen wir diese Entwicklung besser verstehen und auch zu einer Verbesserung von Dialog und Zusammenarbeit beitragen. Ich freue mich daher sehr, dass wir diese Fragen heute gemeinsam mit Experten und Expertinnen aus Afrika und Europa und auch mit Katja Keul aus dem Auswärtigen Amt erörtern können. Aber zunächst freue ich mich auf die einleitenden Worte aus afrikanischer Perspektive und würde das Wort gerne an Professor Tim Murithy vom Institut für Gerechtigkeit und Versöhnung in Südafrika übergeben. Und da ist er auch schon. Vielen Dank. Thank you, thank you very much, and I hope that you can hear me uh, uh, clearly. Uh, greetings from Cape Town, South Africa, and let me start by thanking colleagues um, at uh, Heinrich Ball Stiftung, uh, in particular Simon, for this uh, invitation uh, to participate virtually in this conference. And I think it's very important to convene these sorts of dialogues Uh, between us, uh, the global south and the global north, um, you know, in a world of eight billion people, sometimes you can get the impression that we're living uh, in diff in different worlds. I know we have different, uh, you know, perceptions of uh, emerging issues, and we have divergent, uh, you know, opinions. And I think it's very important for us as human beings to continue to speak to each other uh, in platforms such like as this. So I will keep my comments uh, very brief. I know that there is a very intriguing panel on the Sahel that will be coming up after this. Um, to say that the world is in the major uh, point of crisis is really an understatement. Um, I think, you know, uh, there was a lot of disappointment and misunderstanding um, in February 2022 uh, from Europe and North America when African countries Uh, did not uh, unanimously pick the side of Ukraine uh, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, Europe even questioned whether Africa was really an ally, uh, whether Africa was interested in the so-called uh, rules-based uh, order. Uh, there was, and I think there still is, a uh, lack of understanding or a misunderstanding of the reasons that uh, African countries 
uh, might be choosing the non-aligned approach uh, in their international uh, relations. And now we see uh, with Israel's conflict against Hamas in the Gaza Strip that the pendulum has swung uh, with the International Court of Justice ruling on the 26th of January. Uh, this requires us to adhere to the court order and to international law, but it would appear that globally the, the champions and, and to some extent the co-creators uh, of the international the system of international law, international humanitarian law, international criminal uh, law, are now criticizing the IC, ICJ uh, when it achieves what it was designed to achieve. Um, the ICJ's uh, ruling has been criticized in some sectors, I would say particularly Washington, uh, <clears throat> the case as being meritless, counterproductive, and without any basis, in fact, uh, whatsoever. But I think we saw that uh, from the ruling of 15 to 2, uh, there was an overwhelming uh, decision from the judges that, in fact, the case did have some merit, and it, in fact, uh, uh, was based on facts on the ground. And hopefully it can be a catalyst uh, for peacemaking, uh, almost uh, an idea of an Oslo uh, 2.0. Oh. But the, the ICJ, I think, for one is, is, is an example of where there can be a blind spot, uh, particularly with our friends in uh, the global north, uh, particularly, I think, when dealing with, with Israel, which uh, historically there's a huge legacy there that one has to, to, to confront. And the Hamas attack of 7th of October, which was in violation also of international law, uh, you know, has triggered this, the situation we're in now. The court has ruled on provisional measures to prevent further uh, genocidal acts. I think international law uh, must be seen to apply to all, and uh, Western countries also have a very uh, important role to play in calling out countries that use disproportionate force against a civilian. International law, this body that we have created, uh, you know, has to be our way of preventing chaos, whether it is happening in Ukraine, in Gaza, or the bombing of the Houthis, or historically in Iraq, uh, 2003, Libya, 2011, and uh, Syria, 2011, and Crimea invasion, uh, you know, uh, 2014, which brings us to the 2022 invasion that took place uh, in, in Ukraine. So I think it is an understatement to say that the world is facing a, you know, a tsunami of major uh, crises, a global uh, inflection point. Uh, some have said the old is dying and the new is uh, struggling to be born. Uh, and I would actually even go one step further and say that our international uh, system of collective security uh, has collapsed if it's not collapsing. Um, as an organism, we can even describe the UN Security Council as a living dead organism. It is living, it seems to be alive, but in fact, in terms of its outcomes, its ability to influence and shape peace and security on the, on the, on the global stage, it is in fact um, simply a dying um, uh, body. Uh, and this is linked to you know, the issues around the Sahel, we, we discussed shortly in Africa, Sudan, Mozambique, uh, obviously we've mentioned Israel, Gaza, uh, Russia, Ukraine, and the Houthis tensions between Pakistan and Iran. Uh, all these issues are happening and, and, and emerging in a context where, you know, um, uh, historically, his, uh, Western countries have accused African leaders of failing to defend the rules-based international order um, and the principles of the liberal international uh, order. But the truth is that this uh, rules-based uh, international order has, in fact, not served uh, many countries in the global south. It is uh, often perceived from our perspective as an illusion, uh, contrary to what uh, is uh, uh, the common currency uh, of discourse in the global north. It has essentially preserved the status quo of the major powers, uh, be they Western or Eastern, uh, and have maintained positions of dominance over the global uh, south. And the example of this, obviously, is the, again, the UN Security Council, where China, France, Russia, UK, and the United States have an oversized influence 
on African uh, nations and regulate, in fact, African governments and, uh, you know, treat them almost as bystanders in their own uh, affairs. Uh, and so the call really African countries have been making is for the Security Council and the larger and the broader international system, including the global financial architecture, the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMIF, the World Bank, uh, to be reconfigured, uh, to be restructured on more equitable terms. And we do have an opportunity coming up with the Summit of the Future, a very a important opportunity to create institutions um, that can reimagine and reestablish uh, multilateralism in a manner that is inclusive and equitable uh, for all. If the West wants Africa to stand uh, with the international order, then uh, it must allow the international order to be remade so that it is based more uh, than on just the idea that might uh, make uh, a right. Uh, and uh, I think major power interventions, I would argue, have eroded the idea of the rules-based order and has made the world much more, much less stable uh, going, going forward. Um, we have on the one hand interventions and sometimes illegal interventions that do not have uh, the sanction of the United Nations system. And on the other, you have international failures to intervene uh, to prevent uh, humanitarian uh, crises. Uh, and so there is a there's a much more of a questioning uh, sense of whether, in fact, what we are witnessing is that uh, the dysfunctional international order poses a clear and present uh, danger to many developing uh, countries, and that uh, not only does the system exclude the majority of the world's population from international decision making uh, on on a range of issues but it leaves them at the mercy of more hostile, uh, more powerful uh, countries. So on this basis, I think it's uh, it's really the call from the African continent to rethink and to remake the global order. Um, it does not mean throwing the UN baby out with the bathwater, but it does uh, mean reimagining multilateralism and redesigning international institutions to create more effective uh, global system of collective security. And we do have a pathway uh, beyond simply the, the so-called pact of the future that will be adopted in September in about eight months time at the United Nations the General Assembly. The founders of the United Nations recognized that the world body would not be able to survive indefinitely in its original form. And as a result, they actually included a provision to review and amend the Charter of the United Nations uh, through Article 109, specifically Paragraph 3, uh, which calls for a Charter Review Conference to be convinced, to convened by now a simple majority of the UN uh, General Assembly and, uh, and a vote of seven members of the Security Council. The important point is that this vote cannot be vetoed by the permanent five members uh, of the Security Council, who in the past have been reluctant to embrace uh, the change and a transformation going forward. So as I begin to conclude, I think what African governments are looking for and societies are looking for is uh, the building of a coalition of countries, of progressive countries, uh, progressive actors that could immediately uh, begin to draft a general assembly resolution to put together a charter review conference on the agenda. And this would help us to begin to rethink how we're going to restructure, uh, you know, not only peace and security, uh, but governance and addressing issues like the climate uh, catastrophe, food insecurity, the refugee crisis, and uh, the unpredictable power of artificial intelligence. Um, and I think this is the argument that still we have to continue making uh, because quite a number of our, uh, of our friends in the global north are not convinced uh, that this is a necessary pathway. Uh, but, the, but the Global South has already worked uh, on a number of, uh, of, of, of proposals going forward. I think this really is, is the pathway that we need to be exploring. Uh, and there is a precedent. Um, as the Europeans, you would be familiar of the transformation of the European Economic Community 
to the European Union. Um, so I think we're in a stage where now the world, where the way the world is completely interconnected and interlinked, uh, that we, we need to start thinking about the types of institutions that will actually address challenges such as the Sahel, which you will be discussing uh, shortly uh, going forward. And on those, with those few remarks, I want to, to thank you for this opportunity to, to share some thoughts with you and uh, look forward to listening in and following uh, the, the proceedings of the conference uh, going forward. Thank you very much and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Marithi. Thank you very much for these very uh, sharp and, uh, and interesting uh, statements and, and points on the current uh, global order and also um, how it could be reshaped and, and reformed. Uh, that was very uh, enriching, I think, for, for our debate here uh, to hear. Uh, I hope you will stay with us now. Um, if there's, a, um, in, during the debate, another question for you, um, also from the panel, we would love to, to um, uh, pass this question on to you. Uh, so please stay with us, and, um, and we're looking forward to the debate. I would like to now um, call um, the panelists to the stage, please. And while they're coming to join me here on the stage. I would like to do a quick Mentimeter survey um, and ask my colleague Milena to, uh, to launch it. Please have your, your material ready. I will um, introduce the panel in a, in a second. Yes, here it is. Here's the QR code. Um, you can, you have again, like this morning, two two options, either you scan the QR code here or you just go on menti.com and uh, put in the code. And then we'll have a nice tool to take a bit um, the temperature here in the room on, on some of these uh, questions. And, uh, and maybe that will also um, enrich our debate here. Um, yeah, we can, I think, go. So the first question is, has the European Sahel policy of the past 10 years failed? First question, abs uh, first answer, absolutely. A reorientation is needed. Two, partially. These are elements, there are elements that have worked as well as those that have failed. So a bit like balanced answer. And then there's a rejection answer. No reasons for problems lie outside of the European influence. Everything was working well. We have 50 answers for now. Looks like a mixed bag. 27, 29. Okay, I think we, I think we have an, an idea about uh, what people think. Uh, a lot of people, I mean, half, half, I would say, say yes, absolutely. And, uh, um, and more say partially the elements that worked as well as those that haven't worked. Thank you for that. I think we can uh, continue to the next question. Should the German Bundeswehr continue to engage in the Sahel zone? Yes or no? Very direct yes or no question. Please go ahead. Oh, looks like a tight mixed, uh, mixed image here. Can I actually, I should look there. 54 answers. Also, of course, to those that are listening in from uh, uh, online, you're, of course, also wherever you are invited to join this um, mini-survey. Okay, so there's actually, uh, sorry, that was a bit quick, but I think we had 31 answers, slightly more um, no answers than yes answers, so the, the Bundeswehr uh, should disengage, actually. Then the last one, what should be the focus of German and European engagement in the Sahel? We have four possible answers here. The first one is security, fighting jihadism, very straightforward, maybe more conventional security answers here. Second, development cooperation and humanitarian aid. The third one, climate change, mitigation, adaptation. Okay, here we can see we are in a green foundation still. <laughs> and the fourth, stabilization. Stabilization, I know, between development cooperation and stabilization, the the limits are a bit blurry sometimes. You know, you could probably uh, have, have also missions like um, electoral ob uh, election observation missions um, in both. Uh, but 
you will make your, your answer uh, to the best of your knowledge. 66 answers here. Okay, so climate change is leading, mitigation adaptation, that should be the main focus of a German and European engagement. Other than that, 37 uh, answers in favor of development cooperation and humanitarian aid. Thank you very much. This is an interesting uh, little uh, aperitif to our, uh, to our discussions. Uh, I would like to introduce the, the panel. Uh, first of all, on my left is Katja Coyle. Thanks for being here with us. State Minister, uh, Minister of State, sorry, at the, at the Federal Foreign Office uh, here in Berlin, a long time MP and also the political representative of uh, the minister for the countries of the Sahel, if I, uh, if I pronounce this correctly. Um, on the far left, um, welcome Chris to Berlin and to Germany. He has just arrived from uh, Abuja, Nigeria. Uh, Chris Nigvodo is the uh, Director General at the Office for Strategic Preparedness and Resilience at the Office for the Vice President of Nigeria, uh, based, in, in Abuja, uh, based in Abuja. Welcome, welcome to Berlin, Chris. Great to have you here. Um, yes, I think that it's true that it does deserve uh, an applause. Um, and to my right, uh, last but not least, uh, Lisa Czerna. He, she is uh, uh, part of the Africa Division, Africa Research Division at SWP, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs uh, in Berlin, uh, based in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, she has lived and published extensively on Niger, and, uh, and it's also great to have you here on the panel and your expertise. Thanks for being here. Um, I would like to start with you, uh, Minister of State, uh, Katja. Um, the, commission, the EU Commission President, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, made the following statement uh, um, quite recently. Africa will be a key partner in building the world we want to live in, whether it's on climate, digital or trade. You're now in the process of updating the federal government's Africa policy guidelines. I think the BMZ has also released its guidelines. In what way will these new guidelines and strategies be relevant for the Sahel to kick off the discussion? Well, first of all, I, I would uh, agree with the statement that we need partners on our neighboring continent. and we will only solve uh, the problems together uh, and not each by uh, ourselves. So mm. there is a high interest also for us in everything that's happening on our neighboring con continent because we need neighbors. We need states, governments to talk to about all these uh, challenges. And if states fail and terrorists take over territory, it's, it's terrible for the people who live there. But of course, then, then we are lacking the partners. So uh, there is no question that um, we do have an interest in, uh, in cooperating with our partners. But then, of course, a lot of things uh, the last years changed, so we have to adapt uh, guidelines that happens. I mean, they, they've been from 2019. Since then, we had the pandemic. We have uh, war from Russia, and we have uh, war in the Near East. So that's a normal process, I would say, that we always adapt our strategy. But the, the main focus is that, that we want to deal with our African partners with a different attitude. I mean, we, we are not coming to help or, or give uh, development aid, but we need politically, we need partners, we need strategic partnership, and that's on eye level. So that's a lot, a, uh, a lot different from what we've seen maybe in the, in the last 30 years. And uh, looking for partnership also means of course, to pronounce our own interests. I mean, we do have interests and our partners have interests and we need to exchange on that on eye level. So for example, part of my job the last two years was to, to be present on the continent and to talk with governments about, for example, the different views we have on Russia's attack on Ukraine, to talk to each other about our differences. And then in the end, you always find when you exchange and you talk about it, you, f you find out about your common ground that you still have. And I still think we do have common grounds in a, in a rules-based order, but I'm sure we will we'll come to that point later. But that's so important that we, we, we keep 
being in, in a dialogue, especially when we are not on the same point, so that we can can have a base to to deal with the challenges ahead that we can only deal with together. Mm. Thank you very much, um, Katya. And I think um, actually looking at the Sahel and finding pertinent uh, partners there seems to be increasingly difficult. I'm thinking about the um, the coup d'etat in the last uh, years, especially in uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and, and Niger um, most recently. And um, and also the announcement now from last weekend, I believe, um, from these three countries to leave um, uh, the ECOVAS, the regional um, cooperation, um, the economic uh, cooperation um, um, region in in, the in West Africa. Uh, but I, I would like to give it. We'll we'll come to we'll come back to these points. I would like to give it for now to to Chris. Welcome again. What struck you most seeing the um, seeing our little mini? Uh, survey actually was there something that you found particularly interesting uh, I th you can just talk actually it will be it's fine yeah um, thank you thank you very much Simon and um, thank you to the foundation for your very kind invitation I'm very happy to be here it's my first time in Berlin a lovely city um, and this dialogue I think is um, an excellent opportunity um, I think for a much needed exchange of views um, on very key issues, very pertinent issues confronting us, um, Europe, Africa, the Sahel specifically, um, and then the broader challenge to global peace and order. Um, when I looked at that survey, I, um, I think what struck me the most was, um, I think now there is a growing realization that um, conventional securitized approaches, so conventional security interventions uh, will not be sufficient to, to stabilize the Sahel. And um, that for us is, is very important. Um, I represent or I lead an agency of my government that is um, engaged in looking at conflict from a very different lens, from a more integrative lens um, in terms of human security. And when we look at the Sahel, what we see is a place where a number of human security vulnerabilities have converged and have created what looks like security, like a security problem. But it's only symptomatically a security problem. There are profound issues in terms of human development, uh, in terms of the legitimacy of institutions, even of governments. Um, there are profound challenges in terms of um, um, self-actualization opportunities for young people, access to opportunity. Um, climate, obviously, the Sahel is one of the most challenged places on the planet just in terms of its uh, climatic conditions. Um, so there is this intersection of all of this. So looking at that survey, I saw a realization that um, the security interventions we've had in the past um, have not been adequate. Um, and I think there is disappointment on both sides. Uh, so within the Sahel, there is considerable disappointment that a series of security interventions have not solved the situation in any fundamental way. Um, if you go back to 2011, you had Operation Serval, you had Operation Bakane, you had the G5. Um, but looking back over the last 10 years, um, the footprint of terrorism has actually expanded. Um, when the first intervention was launched, northern Mali was the problem. And then in 10 years, uh, 10 years later, you now have issues in Niger Republic, in Burkina Faso. So that seems like um, the problem, if anything, got exacerbated. Um, and there are different reasons why. I would say that fundamentally, um, military interventions or security interventions cannot solve the sort of problems we have in the Sahel. At best, what they do is they create space for deeper, more fundamental engineering to happen, much like in the same way that in the field of international conflict we recognize that the military option is meant to create a pathway for diplomatic solutions ultimately. Within the context of internal uh, conflicts, military interventions are simply meant to create pathways for much deeper fundamental work to be done. Um, Europe's Sahel strategy 
acknowledges that there are issues that do not lend themselves to military interventions, but there is an argument that that acknowledgement was notional. In practice, um, even though the Sahel strategy does have a civilian component to it, but in, in practice, um, the military component overwhelmed everything else and it quickly, it quickly became mm. centered around the military. Mm. So the thing is, the, first of all, this is a problem that cannot be solved solely by military means. So in looking at that survey, I am both struck and gratified, actually, <laughs> um, by the, the realization, this consensus that is emerging, um, that we would have to take more integrative approaches um, to dealing with this. That, that, that would be my, my opening comment. Thank yeah. you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, I agree that we definitely saw a very um, balanced balanced picture, and and perhaps there's also a bit of an insecurity about what is the what are better approaches. Um, you know, how could they how could they look like? Um, just as a quick follow up um, for you, you know, your office that you're heading now at the uh, Nigerian government was created as part of ECOVAS, right? The um, ECOVAS ex was actually. Um, um, providing uh, the incentives for for all of the ECOWAS countries to um, um, establish such, such an office. Uh, and we're also, by the way, kind of topical uh, colleagues because we both have this focus on, on human security. So um, my question to you would be a little bit, how do you see the future of regional cooperation uh, in the Sahel, uh, um, given the new situation? And, um, and if ever, do you have good examples of, of where you really see that a different approach already um, uh, bears fruits, like uh, gives, gives new results? Um, we look at the issue of regional cooperation. The potential remains immense. It remains great. Um, you have um, a trade area with very huge potential to really lift um, the standard of living for millions of people uh, within West Africa. Um, obviously, we look at what happened this past weekend with Niger, Burkina, and Mali uh, pulling out as a very unfortunate um, um, development. But I think that ultimately this is something that is um, part of our own evolutionary journey um, as a union. Um, incidentally, I think that when we look at ECOWAS, there, I mean, across the world, there are fewer better examples of regional economic cooperation than the European Union itself. Mm. And we look at the evolution of the European Union from the Treaty of Rome, which established the economic community mm. first, and obviously a driving principle behind the formation of the, the, the community was it was a peace building mechanism, really, you know, post, post the Second World War. And to bring countries that had historically been adversaries uh, together in, in, in this framework of trade and mutual interest. And that's exactly what we want to do um, with ECOWAS. Um, so for us, this is something that is part of our evolutionary journey. Um, we believe that consultations um, uh, will immediately uh, be occurring as we speak uh, to see how we can restore um, the union. Um, in terms of human security approaches, for, for this is, I have to say, this is something that is relatively new. Um, I mean, obviously, conceptually, it's not new. Mm -hmm. You would have to go back to the 90s. You have the UN documents and declarations around human security. But now we see um, a more concerted effort to bring these approaches to bear on contemporary problems. So, for example, in my country, in the northeast of my country, where we've battled with an insurgency um, over many years, I used to work in the northeast as well. And for me, part of my own personal learning curve, which is, I think, I would probably speak for a lot of people in my own community as well, is if you ask development actors in the northeast um, and humanitarian actors and security actors to describe the insurgency, what it was fundamentally, development actors would say it's a development crisis. The humanitarian actors would say it's a humanitarian crisis, and the security actors would say it's a security crisis. And we would say, yes, you are all correct, but you are all wrong at the same time. It is all of this mm. happening at the same time, and we have to understand uh, the intersection 
of these issues and be able to reverse engineer our own solutions to that. Mm -hmm. So in the Northeast, um, we're seeing a place where national governments, our partners, uh, our friends, are coming together um, under the rubric of what we like to call nexus thinking um, to engage these different components. But it's really human security we're talking about. Thank you. That's a goal, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, reverse engineer our own solutions. That, um, that is very um, an interesting takeaway point. Yeah, I'm turning to my right. Uh, Dr. Lisa Scherner from uh, SWP, you're part of the research project Megatrends Africa, uh, which is very interesting. I'm recommending it to everyone uh, with a great podcast and, and everything. Um, you, you develop policy advice for German and international actors, and you have lived in, in Niger, um, as was um, said in the introduction. So we've heard about the Africa policy guidelines that are in the process of being updated. There's also new guidelines on feminist foreign policy, and there's also a new national security strategy in, uh, in Germany now. So lots of new guidelines and, and, and strategies. Um, how would you say, how, could, how can this integrated approach that is really core and center of this new national security strategy look like uh, in the Sahel? Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for this question. And first of all, also thanks a lot for the invitation to this uh, very interesting and, and relevant uh, panel. Um, yeah, I uh, have to say that, um, yeah, I am a bit uh, concerned when looking at all these strategies, uh, even though I think it is very important to have clear strategies, because without uh, clear strategies, uh, it's impossible to create a coherent um, German uh, or European approach, which is something that has been criticized also with the failure in the Sahel of the EU strategy that actually there was no real strategy. Uh, so I think it's a very uh, important step to actually be very clear about the goals and uh, about the strategies that uh, Germany and Europe wants to uh, pursue uh, in the Sahel and in engaging with Sahelian partners. Uh, but the challenges uh, that remain, in my view, are first of all that, uh, to be honest, I don't see anything uh, that is uh, really substantially new or innovative in, uh, in the new approach, uh, which is now called the new integrated approach. Um, which we have not already seen uh, under a different term, for example, the triple nexus. So combining, uh, as Chris has just already said, uh, combining uh, development and humanitarian and military approaches uh, uh, was also part of the stabilization strategy in the Sahel. And um, here the, uh, the audience was kind of divided whether the, the Sahel strategy of the EU has failed or not. Uh, in Brussels, actually, everybody agrees uh, that after 10 years uh, of engagement following this strategy, uh, it can be described as a failure. There was a recent debate in the parliament uh, one or two weeks ago uh, where actually everybody agreed that it is a failure. So my worry is a bit, um, if we term it now the new integrated approach um, and we look how it is uh, conceived, we see that there's a lot of we need to strengthen, we need to build up, uh, like uh, where I don't really see that uh, there's any substantial thinking about, uh, about these failures. Uh, what, uh, I mean, on paper, yes, we wanted to combine all these different mechanisms, but uh, in reality, Chris has just described it, uh, there was a lot of uh, hard security measures. Um, there was not so much uh, this human security approach. Uh, there was, of course, a bit of development uh, aid, yes, um, and humanitarian uh, interventions, yes, but this did somehow not really well uh, work together, and there was no cooperation or no integration of these different uh, measures. So I think uh, this is the biggest challenge that remains. Um, but uh, another problem that I see is that um, uh, the strategies, they read very nicely, but they um, have conflicting goals, uh, and these are not clearly identified. And I think in order to put such a strategy into practice, this is something that uh, needs to be clearly also uh, spoken about and, and in a very transparent way in order also not to lose credibility in front of uh, our African partners. So uh, when we, for example, say that we want to combat terrorism, 
Uh, this uh, makes it necessary to collaborate uh, with the armies, with the military sector uh, in authoritarian, more and more authoritarian contexts uh, with highly uh, hyper-masculine entities. And at the same time, we say we want to pursue a, a feminist foreign policy uh, and promote democracy. Um, so there are conflicting goals. And so I think we need to be very clear about the priorities and about how these different goals uh, can be actually uh, thought uh, together and, and, and be implemented together without being contradictory or without losing also our, our credibility um, by applying double standards, which is something that uh, African partners very often, and I think also uh, rightly, accuse uh, European uh, policy makers or decision makers. Um, yeah, so um, I think that there needs to be more clarity uh, with regard to priorities. Um, and um, yeah, what uh, I think is very important uh, is therefore that uh, German and European policymakers um, start en engaging more with the African partners, as Chris has already said, um, so that there needs to be um, yeah, and, and understanding uh, where the needs are and where also local ideas and approaches uh, exist already. Um, before coming up with, with ready-made programs that are mainly perceived by uh, Western um, yeah, experts, uh, professional experts, that often actually fail to understand the local contexts. Um, so, yeah, speaking maybe from a very practical point of view, what, what, what could this mean going maybe beyond this purely more military or security-centered approach? Um, it should, in my view, first of all, mean uh, to not only build up the operational capacities of national armies, um, but also to strengthen mechanisms of democratic control so that we don't uh, build up armies that in the end uh, yeah, end up uh, overthrowing democratic regimes. So there is an imbalance, um, which I think needs to be addressed uh, in, in our future approaches. Um, but uh, most importantly, going beyond a military approach uh, should also mean to stop... Um, yeah, viewing the problem of insecurity only through the anti-terror lens, um, because I think this is also um, largely misinterpreted the problems that we are actually facing. This is maybe the problem that we perceive, or um, people in Europe uh, perceive, as the most threatening problem. But what is actually terrorism in the Sahel? Of course, we have international terror networks uh, like IS or Al-Qaeda, that operate, but these organizations are only successful because they recruit locally. So we need to understand why do people actually join these groups? Why do they offer more than uh, collaborating with the state, uh, for example, offers? Uh, so I think uh, we need to have a better understanding of uh, who these violent actors actually are and take their political claims serious uh, in order to find the right approach to address these problems. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um... Katja, I would like to actually give it back to you and, and ask you, do you actually see at this moment space for new approaches? Actually, is, is, do, you, do you actually see that there's a bit of a, okay, realization, former approaches have failed. Also, you know, I'm not only talking about Germany, but also in France, perhaps, and, and in Europe in general. And now is the time to reorientate, revisit. Or is it rather so overwhelming and so quickly what's happening in, in, the, in the Sahel that it's, it's rather, there's no space really for, for new approaches, but rather reactive kind of crisis management? Well, absolutely, I, I agree with, with what had been said, and, and we already, I mean, this is not, we're just not only beginning, but it's, I mean, the last two years, it's, it's already on the way, a completely mm. new approach, because we realized that a mili military, solu there is never a military solution. We knew, knew that from the beginning, so it was only, part of it all and I would mm. when we t when we ask has this has the approach failed I mean it's difficult to talk about the Sahel I would say there's absolutely different situation in Mali a different situation in Niger in Burkina Faso we still cooperate with Mauritania so we concentrate on those stable countries and support them more and the question about the Bundeswehr I was also a little bit surprised because it's not up to us to decide whether the, the Bundeswehr keeps being in Sahel. There is no question um, the military has been kicked out of Mali, yeah. kicked out of Niger, yeah. and Burkina Faso. There is absolutely no question about the Bundeswehr going to any of these countries because the security cooperation has been stopped. So, but 
um, even before there's already uh, a new, there's already been the new approach started, for example, with Niger, we tried something completely different than what happened in Mali, especially the EU training mission. We know that this is, and we see that when, if a EU training mission ends up with a coup d'etat, then we know something mm. is wrong that's not working. So <laughs> with, with Niger from the beginning, it was actually it was successful. The approach in Niger was a lot less um, heavy on, on, on personal, but it was like the, the, the EU um, Oil Cup uh, Niger mission for the police, but then also for the military training, a lot smaller, more on, the, on, on what the partners need, what they ask for, mobile um, um, units to help the, uh, the, the, mm, the security forces in the border areas that were fragile. Uh, to, to kind of support what the government itself was already doing. So that was a completely different approach already than what happened in Mali. And it was successful in Niger. So it was not, it was different. It was not the f frustration about the mission that led to the coup d'etat in Niger. There was something else with it. So we, we are still not 100% clear uh, for us on, on, on what really happened. But it's a, a, lot, um, a lot different. And so... And what we already started last year was asking the coastal state who have the problem with spillover in their mm. um, uh, border areas, especially the spillover from, from terrorist group from Burkina into Ghana, Benin, uh, Togo. So uh, we developed a stabilization instrument together um, with our American partners asking the coastal states, what is it that you need? What do you... What, how do you see your situation in the border area and how can we support you? So that's what we are doing right now, which mainly is uh, not only about security, it's not about security forces, but it's about a government's presence because that's one of the problems that the governments don't, they are not the, the infrastructure, the government is not present in these areas where terrorists have easy access uh, to, to, to um, uh, the, the, the population. So, so that's a cooperation where the local uh, communities are very much involved uh, saying, well, what we need is we need like a police station or we need schools, we need presence to give the people, the population a security. And that's what we support uh, right there. And I think that's, that's quite what we should concentrate on to answer that question is these kind of stabilization partnerships to help governments be present on the ground and to give their population a certain security. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, I think, a lot more promising approach against terrorists than the military approach. Sometimes you, you need military. There's no question. Sometimes, like in, in, in January 2013, it was clear, and that's what, what I suppo suppo uh, supported and what the, the Green Party supported was clear. That was a situation where the French military intervention saved the, existing, the existence of, of uh, the Mali state. There would have been no state of Mali anymore if, if the terrorists would have taken Bamako. So there was uh, a legitimate and necessary military element to them. But of course, that's not the solution. That's just the beginning. That's not the end. So after that, of course, we can now analyze what we could have done differently. Yeah. But especially the respect of the sovereignty of the country is something we learned that is very important to these countries. And when they feel that they are not involved on our side about their own issues and the, the UN mission is decided on uh, without enough involving their own interests, then of course there there is a rejection right. also uh, against that. So to make it short, I think there is already a lot. A lot has already changed in the approach, and I also agree that it is not about writing a lot of paper and strategy. What we need is a pr pragmatic approach. So we need to really look from day to day what's happening in Niger. How do we deal with them? And we cannot just, um, sometimes with our French partners, I feel like they, some of them, what I heard was like, they are ungrateful, we helped them, they are ungrateful, and now we don't want to cooperate. So there's, but of course in Paris, there's also a lot of discussions going on on how to, what really happens for the French. It's really a traumatic experience that they had. Mm. So 
uh, it doesn't help to just say now we don't talk to you anymore. But I mean, we have to find a pragmatic approach and we have it to find it together with our French partners to have, again, a European approach. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's... Uh might be an interesting topic for another panel <laughs> to have also the uh, French-German discussion on, on this region um, uh, more constructively. Yeah. Just as a quick follow-up, if I may, how we heard it in the introductory remarks by uh, Professor Morithi. How often do you hear this credibility problem uh, in, the, um, in, in your uh, travel to, um, to the Sahel or to African states, uh, the, the question of double standards? And what do you respond Well, that's, that's not only in the Sahel, that's, that's all over the African continent, but also there, it's very different. Some, some on the, on the, uh, the question of, of respect for borders and the Russian aggression, we have a lot of partners also that stand with us and vote with us in the assembly, and then there's others who see it differently. And then we have to exchange when it's different our point of views. And for, for me, it was also... A, Uh, a learning process uh, that we we don't a lot of times we don't realize what their history with freedom movements and their history with Soviet Union how that is still present in the in in the uh, in their um, approach hearts, yes yeah. so but there's as I said when we talk about we come to a, a, a certain common base and that's all African countries they have one thing in common is that with independence, they decided to take the borders as they are and not change the borders, respect for borders, because that was the idea they, they realized when we, when we start fighting about borders, it will be a catastrophe. So respect for borders is a common ground among Africa. African partners and also with us. So that's our common ground. So I would always say, Of course, we heard that uh, the UN is dysfunctional, but I would always say, well, I, I would appreciate having a conference and thinking it new, but we ha it's dangerous as well, because we do have that consensus. And that's a very, very valuable consensus. A consensus if that dated from 1945, and it took a lot of millions of deaths to come to that consensus as it is in the UN Charter. So we should be very careful not to really lose it, even though it might be weak now and it might be put into question, but it's the only UN Charter we have. And if we lose it, nobody gives us another one. So I'd be a little bit more careful about putting it all to the side and thinking that we could sit together and design it new there is a danger that we lose common ground that we definitely need. So this, this ground I really would like to protect. Mm. Thank you, thank you. There is no Charter B, kind of like. <laughs> That's, uh, interesting. Um, Chris, how does this, before actually opening the floor to the audience also for questions, uh, how does this sound to you? Um, is there... Um, What would you wish for, actually? What would you um, give as an advice to, um, to a revised uh, German or European um, policy, if you, um, if you, if you could uh, think about that or elaborate on that? Um, I think um, there needs to be a great deal of intellectually honest reflection on the events of the last 20 years, two decades, three decades. There's a lot of history. And sometimes that history gets glossed over. So let me give an example. With regard to the Sahel, the Sahel has always been a troubled place for various reasons. But the singular most important destabilizing event in the Sahel was the invasion of Libya recently. It destabilized the delicate political ecosystem. Okay. It arose because NATO purported to execute um, an intervention under a right to protect mandate. And then that intervention morphed into a regime change operation. And then, even worse, once chaos ensued, there was no plan. And so the country collapsed, and it ceased to exist 
as a coherent entity. So there is no Libya as we speak. In the course of that invasion, some of the uh, European nations actively collaborated with Islamist or jihadist elements in Libya. Interestingly, Niger opposed the invasion, recognizing that the collapse of Libya, which is right on its northern border, would be catastrophic for it. So we don't talk enough about that. Sometimes we act as though the terrorists or terrorism germinated from the very soil of the Sahel. No, that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. It's always been a troubled place, but there was a delicate ecosystem that was upset by that intervention. So reflection demands a real interrogation of what we might describe as post-colonial vigilantism or imperial vigilantism where countries decide that we're just going to go in and execute a regime change operation regardless of the impact and perhaps without any regard for any kind of post-operation uh, consequences. This has shades of Iraq in early 2000s, you know, written all over it. The second thing is when we think of the global war on terror, and you've, um, Lisa has talked about this, the global war on terror Again, they were strategic errors. And I think sometimes we are reminded of the Cold War when we looked at the world through a bipolar lens. And anyone that didn't agree with us was a communist. And it didn't matter what they were actually doing. We just felt they were communists, and the communists were the bad guys. And so in the era of the global war on terror, we started calling them jihadists, Islamo-fascists, Islamists. We used the terms interchangeably. Mm. Sometimes we were just dealing with nationalism. But a side effect of that was that it provided despotic governments on the continent with vocabulary to use against their political opponents, and therefore reversed the course of democratization on the continent. And so from the African perspective, there is a bit of confusion. It's not even, it's not just about double standards. Yes, we, we, that is the expression. But we say, for example, if we take President Macron, he makes a very important point. I listened to a speech of his, maybe from last year or the year before, and he talked about the absence of governance in certain places. And we all understand that. But, African nations, including the new countries that have just been taken over by military regimes, look at France's relationship with Chad and say, how can you possibly have a problem with military governments? You don't have a problem with military governments. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult for an African government to accept that you say you have a problem with a military government, except when it's happening in Egypt or when it's happening in Chad and in places where Western governments have actively participated or collaborated or supported subversions of democratic movements. It becomes very confusing. So I think the relationship requires some honesty. Africans are sophisticated enough, I think, to recognize that perhaps there's an element of pragmatism in these relations. If that is the case, then maybe we should just stop saying that we have a blanket support for democracy, because that is clearly not true historically. And then we approach the situation from a much more realistic perspective. But I think what people find upsetting on the continent is when we proclaim very grandly commitments to democracy and act in the opposite you know, in, in, in a contradictory fashion. So that creates problems. And it does create problems even for democratic movements on the continent, because then they cannot be taken seriously. Because they, it, their opponents would simply say to them, nobody really believes in what you're talking about. Not even your own friends believe in what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So there is that. Um, I think broadly, I would also want a situation where perhaps the conversation expands beyond the tropes that have come to dominate it. So for example, um, we talk about migration. And again, when we think of Libya, um, when Libya collapsed, 
in, in, in the aftermath of, of that episode, one thing that became clear, we saw Western nations immediately move to secure the borders because they recognized the nation might have collapsed, but now we need to secure the borders. And again, that involved engaging very unsavory elements to control those borders, elements that under perhaps ideal or saner circumstances we should not be empowering. So that became problematic. And so European foreign policy becomes centered very narrowly around issues of migration. We would take Niger, for example, and invest heavily in border governance, but we were not thinking too strongly about what was going on in the hinterland of Niger itself. Um, that, that is you know, problematic. And so I think that we need to expand the conversation. This is not just about migration. The fates of Europe and Africa are intertwined. It goes back centuries. There is a strategic context that we must accommodate in this conversation in that trans-Saharan energy resources, for example, hold potential for Europe as it struggles to contain Russia's own aggressive weaponization of energy when dealing with Europe. There are other things we could be talking about when we expand the agenda of conversation. The demographic decline of Europe suddenly makes Africa's own contradictory demographic position more interesting. Is there room for synergy, perhaps? But can we have a conversation that is not just about the hordes of Africans about to swamp the shores of Europe and invade it? You know, that sort of thing. Can we move beyond that? So if we expand the conversation, then it becomes, you know, sort of richer. Thirdly, what I would say is when we think of democracy, I think that at the beginning of, um, in the post-Cold War era, when there was this um, self-congratulation and jubilation around the triumph of the West and triumph of liberal democracy, um, we made some conceptual mistakes in Africa. And to simplify, we indicated that democracy is a destination rather than a journey. And perhaps we should talk more in terms of democratization as a process that happens in degrees. If you read the history of Europe, obviously for us, you don't need to hit, read the history of Europe, but we do yeah. see the evolution of liberal democracy in the West. It took time. There was a gradualism to it. This is evolution. We are talking about political evolution. So perhaps we should use that lens in looking at the continent, in looking at other areas as well. Um, so when we've had to discuss these new military regimes, I personally do not agree that what we have witnessed is some kind of democratic recession. No, I think you have, because that supposes that you are dealing with liberal democracies and then suddenly they became totalitarian systems. No, that, that's not what's happening. This is a bump. This is part of the evolutionary journey. This is our struggle to democratize. And that involves many things other than holding elections that may or may not even be genuine elections. So in some places, what you have is not so much a problem of elected governments versus military governments. What you have is a contest between two forms of authoritarianism. Mm. And so you have uniformed authoritarians and non-uniformed or electoral authoritarians. And I think those nuances need to be accommodated in our reflection and in our analysis. Um, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for um, not only deconstructing for us um, a little bit this whole um, enigma of double standards and credibility issues, but also uh, pointing out uh, interesting areas of, of commonality and, and common interest. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, thanks to the audience for, uh, for your patience. I would now like to open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, please raise your hand, um, introduce yourself uh, quickly, and please direct your question or short comment to one of the panelists. And also, if you have one for Professor Morithi that was in the introductory, he left actually. Okay, no problem. Then, not anymore. Yeah, here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marie Kirchner. Um, 
yeah, I don't know whom I'm representing. Um, I'm at Graz University, um, PhD student, and I'm so happy that we're kind of that we took this turn towards the end of the day. We were actually talking about human security. We were actually talking about ways how to not respond to war and conflict, but how to actually, um, yeah, how to find ways to actually work towards peace and work towards democra uh, dem democratizing. And I, um, I think I don't really have a question, but I have a lot of thoughts right now that I will be working on um, at the end of the day. Maybe a comment that you could pick up on, because what I just wrote down in my little notebook is this idea about democracy not being a destination, being a process. And I feel that that's actually something that is so true for the region where we are in right now, here in Europe. It's something I thought about earlier in the day when we were talking about Ukraine a lot, where now we're talking about deterrence and we're talking about weapons and we're talking about militarization. And I feel that what is being lost in all of these conversations is how we think about democracy, which where we stop thinking how does militarization actually impact how we understand democracy and that our reaction to, oh, our democracy might be in danger, is militarization. Um, so thank you very much for turning things around to that angle. And may, I, I apologize for not having a proper question here. It's just really like so many thoughts in my head right now. But if that's something you'd want to pick up on and further elaborate, I'd be very thankful. Uh, help me out with my thinking. Uh, yes, here and there as well, Lukas. Yeah. Thank you very much. Dominikus Vogel, um, I'm a sociologist and working for a social research institute. I, um, yeah, my question is for Chris, but also maybe for the other panelists. Um, especially you mentioned the evolutionary journey, but you also referred to the European Union as one example of a union. And basically at the moment, maybe the only example the African Union looks at in building their unionizing journey. So my question is, what do you think you would adapt or like copy, but also what would you change and do differently so that maybe the European Union can work and learn from still unite, uh, uniting Europe? We haven't done that yet. Yeah, we started it, but we are not there yet. Thanks a lot. Here, Lucas, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Uh, question primarily to, to Katja uh, you, you mentioned the, the policy, the European Union policy, um, as something that is decided between France and Germany. Um, I know that it's a shortcut, but there was a, uh, something along the lines that we should have a French-German conversation uh, about it. Uh, so I, I would like to give you also sure. the opportunity to expand on what's the, what, are, what can the other uh, EU countries and other institutions uh, do and how do they uh, impact this policy, especially it's not Sahel but the adjacent region, it seems that Hungary right now has its own Chadian policy. So can you expand on what the other EU countries can do? <laughs> True, that was a very interesting uh, chapter of Hungarian foreign policy. Uh, any other questions here in the room? No? Okay, then yes. It's okay, yeah, please. Christoph Hansert from the German Academic Exchange Service. Um, when I was uh, director of our Africa office, I have seen a very interesting model of peace building in the north of Uganda. Um, and in the center of that peace building was Gulu University. So what would be your take, what uh, um, role could universities as a center of peace building play in information and in bringing um, different actors and stakeholders together? So peace building by Africans for Africans and not by Europeans for Africans. Thank you. Um, Katja, do you want to go first? Okay, I'll try my best. Um... I was co-guilty co co in the French-German <laughs> debate, so sorry. <laughs> okay, so... Not only you. Um, 
I, I agree on the, the vision that democracy is, uh, is a process. And that, that's what, what made us also, especially with Mali, with Bamako, we had this debate on how to be pragmatic or not pragmatic. But when you, when you see, when, you, when I went to, to Bamako especially and, and debating with the civil society, you could really feel, well, you know, it's, it's not about the election, they say. Yeah, we are democratic and we want a democracy, but where we are right now, the election for us is not the most important thing. We, we, we need to go our way. And that's, that's also why we understood and said, okay, well, you know, take, it's not, uh, if, if you don't do the, the election at that day, then we leave you alone or so. This is not just not working because uh, it's, democracy is just not about just an election. So, and there is uh, uh, a good reason to be also pragmatic with these uh, regimes, but of course it always depends. Every regime is different, of course, but that's what I mean by looking at it pragmatically and saying, okay, we, we try our best to do this together. But sometimes, of course, sometimes it doesn't work, okay? Uh, so right now, with, in these three countries, we still talk with them, of course, but there's, of course, a really hard cut on, on cooperation, especially when it comes to security. There is no common base right now, but hopefully someday there'll be cooperation again. Um, the... The, the 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 French and and German the, yeah of course this is not about France and Germany but and it's not only the fault of the French um, I I want to make it clear they had a well they they were they're maybe now realizing that they need to change certain uh, approaches let's put it dim diplomatically but also for German governments of course it was quite easy in the past to say, hey, the Sahel, that's the French, their strategy. We just follow whatever they say, we let it go, and we don't get in too much involved. So I think there's two parts. I mean, we need to realize that if we want to be successful, then we can only do it together, which means we, as German government, need to be, of course, more involved also in the strategic process. We cannot leave our French uh, neighbors alone, uh, and that's for all of the EU, of course. So this is, I think, something that's really changing deeply now. And uh, we see that especially um, also, I mean, it's not just the Germans left the French alone, but maybe other European partners as well. So it's, it's, it, it's our uh, duty to come back together and to, to, to see how we can do it. And uh, we see that a lot of change is taking place uh, in Paris right now and their debates, and we need to be involved in that and be part. So we are trying, we, we're traveling, we're going to Paris and saying, hey, here we are, let's do this together. Uh, it somehow it didn't work, but of course everybody else can do that as well. And then we find, because what we saw in Bamako was that the regime, the, the regime tried to tell us all the time, oh, yeah, um, we don't have a problem with you, Germany. You're doing a good job. It's the French. It's, that's the bad guys. You're the good guys. And so I said, hey, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is not how it works. <laughs> we are a family, and we might talk inside the family, but for you it's clear you e either deal with all of us or with none. You cannot try to divide us. Um, so we don't let that, that happen. But still, of course, there is no secret that we we need to find a common a common ground. Um, about the the security by Europeans for Africa, I think this is never ever. This is just it's clear. This is not working. So what I think, what we realize now is that if we want to um, support um, peace and, and and stability, that it might make more sense instead of doing it bilaterally. Uh, to really more to focus more on the regional organizations in Africa because they are the stability actors that we see in ECOBAS, for example, or SADC or East African Community because this is resembles more like what we like the EU what we tried as you said it's it's uh, it's community it's to be I mean peace is the motive to come together so and that's um, uh, and that's can be a, a strong partner for us to support an organization like ECOVAS, because they are the ones that, that can be the, the mediators uh, for, for, the, for the conflicts a lot better than we could ever do. So 
I think we should uh, focus more on, on regional organizations. Thank so, you. Yeah. Uh, Chris, do you want to continue pick pick that point up by of uh, regional organizations and EU? Um, okay, and then I'll just sure, sure. answer the, the yes. rest of the questions, right? Okay. Sure, sure. Um, I, I, let me pick up on what you said about the distinction between uh, Germany and France in the Sahel and their approaches. Um, of course, I recognize that um, the EU wants to engage as a, a united family and um, with a coherent approach. Um, but we must also recognize that Germany and France have different histories in the Sahel. In the Francophone African countries, and in Francophone West Africa specifically, including the Sahel, there's a very rich vein of anti-French sentiment going back to the colonial history. Um, that cannot be overwritten or glossed over. Um, and contrary to some Western analysis, it's not a product of Russian disinformation. Russian disinformation did not create anti-French sentiment. It amplified it, it exploits it, but it didn't create it. It's always been there. So that has to be understood, uh, just in terms of you know not suddenly finding yourself inheriting enemies that you have no idea when you first quarreled. You know, um, so we have to understand that that there's a very specific resentment of France, and um, the military regimes have ridden on that. They've used that. They've become vehicles of that, and now they purport to be righting historical wrongs. Um, so those are things that are very that account for what we see uh, in terms of the appeal of these regimes in these countries. The second thing, I, which again I think you've pointed out, is um, some years ago. I mean, Bamako obviously is is one of the countries that you know, or one of the places we work in, um, and we have links with, but. Um, as of 2022, what we found was that, quite frankly, um, the only people that were really, really interested in elections and, and you know, felt this is a big deal for us um, were the upper middle class elite of Bamako itself. In Gao, in Kidal, in Timbuktu, in other places, their biggest concern was security. And is that we just want to be safe and quite we don't care. We we, we don't care who 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 who, who protects us. If, if an elected government can protect us, great. If an unelected government can protect us, that is equally fine, but we just need to be safe. And sometimes these issues are quite existential. Actually, only only living people can vote, right? You have to be alive to vote. So it, it, it gets very basic and therefore very simple and there's a clarity to it. So it's important that um, we recognize that. Um, you spoke earlier and you made an interesting point about African countries, the agreement about borders, the sanctity of colonial borders. Yes, that is true. That, uh, that was agreed upon and that was um, at the time, within the context that that happened, you, you have to understand African nationalist movements were trying to free their countries and they wanted to do it quickly. And they recognize that if we start having extended conversations and fights over colonial borders, we are not going to make any headway. So the trade-off is to accept the borders as they are, and then we move on from there. But you know, since that time, Ethiopia and Eritrea became separate countries. They fought a war for 30 years, and then Eritrea was born. More recently, uh, South Sudan. You know, came out of. So now there is at least, by reason of the existence of these two examples, people are willing to say maybe we can review things. Maybe we don't have to inherit everything um, and accept them as, as, you know, as fixed uh, points in our history. And this is important because part of the instability in the Sahel speaks to this very problem. If you look at the Tuareg population, for example, um, the Tuaregs are found in Niger, they're found in Mali, they're found in Algeria, uh, they're found in Burkina Faso. Um, over the years, over decades actually, there have been various Tuareg um, uprisings. But the centerpiece of the Tuareg uprising has been to create their own uh, states, 
um, Azawad, as they call it, that would cut across all of these borders. Now, Gaddafi, when he was alive, recognized that and decided, for his own interests, obviously, to support that and use that to destabilize um, the, the region. Um, but I say that to point out that even when actors, bad actors, destabilize the place, in many instances, they are not inventing anything. They are exploiting already existing grievances. So to that extent, terrorism, terrorists, are merely symptomatic. As you pointed out, Lisa, the terrorists come in and exploit the situation. They look for already existing cleavages, already existing tensions, and then insert themselves into that. And in so doing, they localize their struggles. In Mali, when the first Al-Qaeda um, efforts to, to infiltrate Mali came, it, it hit a brick wall because it was seen as an overtly Arab uh, expansionist project. And only when they decided to domesticate their, their, their insurgency, using the language of marginalization, the very, very specific local context within Mali, did they become successful? We are seeing similar patterns of recruitment now among the nomadic community, the Fulani nomadic community in other parts of West Africa, in Burkina particularly, even in Mali as well, where the, the, the insurgents have recognized that if we are going to gain traction, we have to speak to the issues, the marginalization and the alienation of communities. And that is, I contend, their greatest strength. That is what they have uh, going for them. Um, so having said that, I, I'd like to say something about the very interesting comment you made. I think in the context of Euro-African dialogue, analogies are important. And you make an interesting point about now you know, how in Europe there appears to be perhaps a democratic recession or perhaps attacks on liberal democracy. And that is important. And I find that very fascinating because we see, we observe obviously from our own continent, we see the rise of right-wing governments and the rise of illiberal political movements. And we see that in the context of this reaction to the deepening diversity of their societies because of migration. Now, when I look at that, I think back to my own continent in the 60s and in the 70s, African one-party states explicitly said the reason they needed one-party states was because their societies were too diverse. And if they allowed multi-party competition, it would lead to ethnic fragmentation of those countries. So they used, the one, they used that as justification for promoting one-party states. So I look at you know, the, what you've pointed out, and I wonder, is there not a parallel here that could inform some you know, uh, cross-continental reflection, some analysis, perhaps, in terms of where could Europe be heading? What could we learn from each other's experiences, you, you know, uh, uh, mutually speaking? Um, so, so that's, I mean, that's the subject of another seminar. I'm not going into that. <laughs> Um, uh, I think okay. someone asked about um, what should we do with the AU. That, that's what you asked, the AU in terms of what we can learn from the EU. Um, honestly, there's a lot to learn from the EU. Um, as I said, Europe, centuries of warfare, centuries, so much that across the broad, perhaps if you look at the, the, the full span of European history, there have been more years of war, and the recent peace we've enjoyed is remarkable, but it is rare. And I look at the EU as an exemplary mechanism of peace building. It's brought people together, um, and it's used different tools. You, you may, may or may not know this, but we are very big followers of the European Champions League, for example, the UEFA Champions League. We love all that stuff. We, we, we love it, you know, back home. Um, so we look at those things, and we have created institutions of our own that sort of borrow, um, learn from what you've done. For us, the challenge in Africa in terms of integration is infrastructure. 
there's a huge infrastructural deficit on our continent that needs resourcing to be able to achieve the level of integration um, that you have achieved here. Having said that, we also recognize that, again, integration is a journey. Because in Europe, you have a very strong sense of national identity. And now you've created this umbrella to subsume, as it were, all these national identities. Now, um, obviously, there's some contention, as we've seen with Brexit, for example, being the most extreme example. Um, but I think that this kind of civilizational project that brings people together, that creates diverse and plural societies under one umbrella, I believe that that is the future for everybody, that this is the only viable way to live, it's the only viable way to solve problems, whatever that pro those problems might be, climate change, what, uh, world peace, whatever it is, this is the only way um, to go. But it is a journey. And along the way, we will counter forces or have to confront forces that do not hold uh, to that same vision, do not believe in, in that vision of, of shared humanity, uh, you know, uh, as it were. Um, so incidentally, one of the reasons why China is successful in Africa is that it is building integrative infrastructure. The Western colonialists built infrastructure, but the infrastructure was extractive. So, for example, mm. the British would build a railway from Kano in Nigeria all the way to the coast in Lagos, but it was meant for extraction and exportation. Mm. The rest of the country remained unconnected. But now, what, one of the reasons why China is very popular is that what it tries to do, both through its Belt and Road Initiative and other initiatives, it's, it's trying to build integrated infrastructure. So if you look at what it's done in the Sahel, you find that it's connecting critical nodes from the Sahel all the way down to the Horn of Africa. So that's if in a paradoxical way, you've got... So sometimes when Western analysts talk of Chinese colonialism, and it seems like the Africans are not... Uh, you know, they don't seem to be buying it. It's simply because Africans, having experienced colonialism, say, we saw colonialism and this doesn't look like it. This looks like something different, okay. right? Yeah. So, uh, you okay. know, but that, that's what I would say to all this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We're already slightly over time, so I just want to yes, uh, give, uh, give it very quickly, one more time uh, back to the f uh, floor, to just say very shortly, if you would have to break it down to one exemplary project of a new European-African partnership, something that we can be proud of in, let's say, 10 years together, uh, what would it be? <laughs> I know there's been lots of food for, food for thought, but uh, trying to wrap this up. I think for me, uh, the, the, the successful story would be that we have uh, listened more than lectured uh, okay. what we have done too much in the past. Thank you. Okay. Katja? Well, it's about visions that we want to have about our relationship or... Visions uh, or an well, example like or... Like you, you uh, mentioned the, the, the um, potential in the demographic uh, structures. So I would have the vision of... Uh, peace and stability, of course, on both continents, and then uh, mobility between the two continents, so that the old demographic society of Europe and the young, the, the youth of Africa come together and, and give their very best, and then we have a, a situation where we both prof benefit from each other, yes. Okay, thank you. Chris? Um, I think as my last word, um, someone Forgive me, I, I missed the... You asked about universities and peace building. Um, we have a partnership with a network of researchers across um, universities in Nigeria and West Africa. And we've been working with them precisely to do this very thing um, that you're talking of, um, trying to develop homegrown peace building strategies, homegrown, very locally contextualized um, peace building mechanisms. Um, so that remains an area of huge uh, promise. Um, for us. So I absolutely agree. Universities, higher institutions, our intellectuals and scholars um, have a huge role um, to play. And we are 
that's one of the things um, we're working on. And I think just in terms of the question you asked, I think that that is even an area where, again, we could look at partnerships, again, between European institutions and African institutions in terms of being able to support this sort of work. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, so this was the 24th Foreign Policy Conference. Thank you uh, so much for coming. Thanks for uh, staying with us until late today. Thank you to these wonderful panelists. This was a very um, interesting, I think, last panel. Um, I would like to thank uh, the team of the Foreign Policy Division. Of course, uh, there's uh, uh, not a second, um, uh, not another person as uh, Giorgio Franceschino, who has uh, led this uh, organization of, the, uh, of this conference. Uh, my thanks also go to, yes, that's true. My thanks goes to the whole team. It's been really a big pleasure and honor to work together with you. Milena Grünewald, Felicitas Böhm, um, the translators, thank you very much to the technical team, Philip Straub, also from the uh, event management. Uh, see you next year, stay posted, uh, stay with us, and good evening. <laughs>